Hi, welcome everyone to the Magnets uh, series of seminar. Uh, today, I'm really happy to uh, to share that we are going to have a presentation by John Mount from Leeds University on the influence of Earth's mantle on long-term spatial and temporal structure of the Earth magnetic field. Uh, so, John, please take it up. The floor is yours. Okay, uh, you can see that. Yes, that's great. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for inviting me along today to talk about some work I've been doing with Chris Davies. Um, it's uh, been published this year in Nature Geoscience. And if anyone was at my IUGG talk, apologies, you're going to see many, many of the same slides again. Um, and so, what we've been looking at is whether or not slash how the Earth's mantle and convection in the Earth's mantle might influence uh, dynamics in the Earth's core and hence the sort of observable magnetic field of the Earth on long time scales. Um, and there's different ways you might come to ask this question of why we should study that. I'm going to come at it from a geodynamics point of view, because that's mainly where my background lies. Uh, and so sort of a, a quick reminder, um, of the dynamical differences of sort of the earth in broad scale. We've got the mantle, the outer core, and the inner core. The mantle and the inner core are solid. Um, the inner core is a low viscosity fluid and so is conducting very vigorously. It's also metallic and so is a good conductor of heat and electricity. And that's the region where the earth's sort of geodynamo process operates and rates the earth's magnetic field. Um, in converse, the overlying mantle, silicate mantle, um, much higher viscosity. And although it does convect on geological time scales, it does so much, much more slowly. Uh, and there's a consequence of this in terms of how the heat escapes through the Earth. And so figuring out exactly how much heat is moving through a given layer of the Earth is a challenging problem, but you know, a reasonable estimate is something like 10 terawatts of heat is conducted across the core mantle boundary. And so that heat is then carried upward by convection in the mantle away from the core mantle boundary and upward by a convection in the core towards the core mantle boundary. And it's predominantly convection that carries that thermal energy to or away from the core mantle boundary. And we know how much energy is carried by convection. So the heat flux or the heat flow carried by convection depends on the density of the material, its heat capacity, how fast it's moving, the area that we're moving through, and how big the temperature anomalies are um, that are, are carrying the, the hot material up. And of course, we have estimates for those things for the mantle and for the core. And so if we sort of put in our estimates for density and heat capacity and flow speeds, in the mantle, the lateral temperature variations are something on the order of 100 Kelvin, and they evolve very slowly through time. Whereas on the, on the core size, the lateral temperature variations associated with free convection are a fraction of a milli Kelvin, and they will evolve quite quickly um, you know, on the order of years, decades, centuries, compared to the mantle, where the pattern is essentially fixed for millions of years. And so a consequence of this from a dynamical point of view is that the sort of the slowly convecting mantle sees the core mantle boundary as an isothermal boundary condition. The outer core is essentially a, a constant temperature fluid from the mantle's point of view. And any changes are, or any differences, lateral variations are very small and rapidly disappear. Whereas from the core's point of view, the lateral variations on the mantle side are quite large and quite long lived. Um, and they do not, you know, they stay fixed in place on the time scale of convection. Um, and so in terms of what that means is it is natural to express the boundary condition on the top of the core as one in which there are lateral variations in heat flux. Hot regions of the mantle will extract less heat from the core. Cold regions of the mantle will extract more heat from the core. And so we can get a sense of what this should look like from the mantle sort of side, relying on seismic tomography. So we have seismic tomographic maps of the mantle where we see fast and um, sorry, fast and slow regions in the mantle, which we can then interpret in terms of the mineralogy and temperature structure. And so there are you know, 
subducting slabs. Um, and there are the large low velocity provinces under the Pacific and um, Africa. And exactly what the nature of those large low velocity provinces is, is still somewhat debated. There's going to be some mixture of thermal and compositional difference between the large low velocity provinces and sort of the rest of the mantle, but there's certainly a thermal component. And so these regions are um, hot relative to the rest of the mantle and um, you know, on the order of say 100 Kelvin, which will be very large compared to the temperature anomalies of free convection in the core. And so if we take our inferences from seismic um, tomography for what the um, uh, mineralogy and temperature is of these regions, we can work out what the temperature gradient is, what the thermal conductivity of these regions is, um, and then get a map of heat flow across the core mantle boundary. And since we have relatively hot regions, the temperature changes relatively slowly. We'll have a low temperature gradient um, in the LLVPs, higher temperature gradients in under regions of subduction or where cold material reaches the core mantle boundary. Um, and we end up with a map of heat flux across the CMB that looks something like this. So this is a uh, sort of mineral physics calculation by Stephen Stackhouse here at the University of Leeds. Um, and so we've got uh, heat flux here, uh, where blue means low heat flux, red means high heat flux. You can see um, under the Pacific, where the large low velocity provinces, there's very low heat flux. And similarly, under the African large low velocity provinces, and then in surrounding regions, there's higher heat flux. And there's quite a large variation on the order of, say, 20 milliwatts per meter squared to 120 milliwatts per meter squared. And so the range of the variations is on order the same scale as, as sort of the average value we basically go from almost zero to almost 140 with an average of 70 um, in this particular calculation. So there's very large lateral variations in heat flux across the core mantle boundary. Um, and we might therefore expect to see a difference in dynamics. Um, and this is something that people have studied before. And so here on the left, sort of a cross-sectional cartoon of the sort of dynamics we might expect from a study by Julien Aubert. Um, and so this is looking at the outer core. So we've got the inner core, core mantle boundary, and we're thinking of a situation where we've got a cold bit of the mantle extracting more heat that will tend to make um, dense fluid at the top of the core, which will promote downwelling in those regions. This is where the mantle is hot, mantle extracts less heat, so we do not have that ability to sort of cool down the top of the core, generate dense fluid. And so we do don't see downwelling as much in those regions. That tend to be regions where we might expect to see upwelling. And so we might get the sort of large scale circulation um, of fluid being made cold in particular reasons, sinking down into the lower outer core, perhaps interacting with the inner core as well, and then rising up in some sort of large scale gyre driven by the pattern of convection and hence heat flux coming from the mantle. And that's something that we do see in some inversions of geomagnetic data. We can look at the secular variation of the geomagnetic field and use that to infer um, horizontal flows at the top of the core, flows at the top of the Earth's core. And if we make some additional um, uh, considerations for how those flows might be uh, propagated down into the core, we can get this sort of result. So this result that Luis Silva did when he was at Leeds, um, inverting geomagnetic data for core flow. And these inversions are non-unique, so other um, solutions are possible. But this sort of general structure is one that comes up a lot. And so you can see that there is a region of preferred downwelling leading to a large scale gyre. So fluid goes down and wraps around the inner core. Um, and then comes back up. And so there's a large scale gyre here um, that sort of is at um, equatorial regions on the African side and then sweeps around and then passes close to the inner core on the Pacific side of the inner core. And then there's another smaller gyre on the Pacific side. Um, so that's sort of um, a sort of fluid dynamics coupled with geomagnetic observations reason. Um, this again has been studied, fluid dynamics has been studied in uh, physical experiments, laboratory experiments. This is work done by Samita and Olson. 
And so we can see a sort of a top-down view of a rotating convection experiment where they have, in this case, a heater in one plate in one little spot. So this is quite a localized um, anomalous uh, heat flux boundary condition. But again, it's sort of needing this to this large scale flow, which you can see in the picture, there's this front sort of like a weather front where uh, warm material um, moves off to the side. And then there's sort of a front between warm and cold material and a sort of a circulating flow um, in the large scale. There's also lots of small scale turbulence going on, uh, but you can see there's sort of this large scale um, flow in the schematic and this sort of relatively stationary sort of front between the warm and cold fluids. And you can see that here in the isotherms of um, fluids as well, right? There's sort of hot fluid here um, that sort of traveled over and then sort of colder fluid in, that it comes in contact with and this sort of this, this counter flow. And so for those reasons, um, there's been a fair amount of interest over the years in terms of how much um, the sort of heterogeneity of CMP heat flux influences dynamo action in the core. And so there have been a number of dynamo studies um, this is one from Ashley Willis um, and, and Dave Gubbins and, and et cetera um, from 2007, where they were looking at relatively modest conditions, um, ECMA numbers. They're, you know, I'm a non empirical dynamo person, uh, so there'll be a lot of non-dimensional numbers. I'll try not to stress them too much, um, but relatively, you know, ECMA numbers of 10 to the minus four, um, relatively, which is sort of this, you know, importance of viscosity is relatively low relative to Coriolis, um, relatively weakly forced in terms of the Rayleigh number, um, and then uh, heat flux patterns and heat flux amplitudes of varying sorts. And what they found is that as they increase the amplitude of the heat flux um, heterogeneity, so that's epsilon is their parameter um, showing that, that they ran into situations where the convection would lock to the boundary condition. So you get a locked dynamo, a very steady dynamo um, through time. And um, there wouldn't be much um, evolution of that field, but it would look very much like the present day field, um, but it would be very much locked in place and not evolve much through time. And in some cases, as they increase even further, they find that the dynamo would fail. And so one of the things that they found with, in their simulations, increasing lateral heating much beyond, in this, for this parameter much beyond one, leads to dynamo failure. And so for very strong lateral forcing, they found that the dynamo would fail. And even at moderately strong lateral um, forcing, they would tend to lock the dynamo to the pattern of mantle convection. And so one of the things that we wanted to look at in our study is whether or not those conditions would change um, if we had different um, combinations of core dynamics and mantle dynamics. And so we're going to look at different uh, sort of amplitudes and patterns of mantle heterogeneity. We've also at times looked at different orientations of mantle heterogeneity. Mostly what we looked at in this study, well, really in this study, we just looked at the amplitude of that mantle heterogeneity. So we've taken the tomographic model and just said, well, there's a bit of flex in terms of how strong those lateral variations might be. So we varied those. Other questions that we might think about or hoping to think about is how these patterns vary over geological time and what that might mean for sort of paleomagnetic reconstructions. Um, regardless, if we impose these patterns, how might, uh, and from the mantle, how do they influence the flow? Does that change when you change um, the sort of conditions of the core dynamics to more earthly conditions than was possible in the past? And how does that influence the uh, magnetic field, particularly the observable characteristics of Earth's magnetic field? Uh, and so, as I say, uh, I'm a, so we do quite a bit of sort of fluid dynamics and fluid dynamics, we always have our non-dimensional numbers. For us, a key non-dimensional number there we call Q star, which is a measure of the strength of this um, peak to peak heat flux anomaly. So how big are the differences between minimum and maximum heat flux relative to the average heat flux out of the core? And you need to reference that to how much heat is conducted along the core adiabat, um, which, um, it you know, depends on various physical properties of the core, which we can um, estimate from seismology, um, but also depends on the thermal conductivity of the core, which is more difficult to get at. And so if you take the widest possible range of um, thermal conductivities published over the last decade or 15 years, you would get something 
uh, between 50 to 100 milliwatts per meter squared as this adiabatic contribution coming from the core that we need to worry about. And that's quite a wide range. I think people would these days argue that we should be somewhere a little bit more in the middle as much is more likely. But um, regardless of, of what you do, that sort of adiabatic heat flux that you ex extract off um, tends to reduce the uh, denominator, but not the numerator in this equation. And the result is that if you put in reasonable values of Q star, you pretty much are always going to get um, Q star of being at least one. Um, and this is similar to the epsilon per parameter that um, we were talking about in the previous study. And so we think that heterogeneity really should be large. And in fact, it could be much, much larger than one, depending on exactly what the sort of the adiabatic heat flow along in the core is and exactly what the heat flow across the uh, core mantle boundary is. But certainly values greater than one are, are likely. Uh, and so we're going to take that as the boundary condition. We're then going to run dynamo um, codes, dynamo simulations, and there's some numerical simulations of the dynamo, say through the, st say the standard set of dynamo equations for the fluid velocity, the magnetic field, the temperature perturbation. We're in a spherical shell with Earth-like geometry, um, radial inward gravity, um, these sorts of things. We're using the Boussinesque approximation, um, uh, et cetera. And so, in our simulations, we need to set you know, sort of various uh, parameter numbers that we set in the simulations that um, control uh, different sort of, you know, for example, the F number of force balances or um, et cetera in the Earth. And so in the Earth, there are various estimates for what these numbers are. We can't reach um, those values in the simulations that we have done, but we have moved as far towards them as we can, so we've moved um, down in Ekman number compared to the earlier simulations. We moved up in Rayleigh number compared to the earlier simulations. Um, we brought the magnetic parental number down, um, and we've tried to increase the CMB heat flux heterogeneity factor um, to as much as we can. Not as large as um, we think it might be in the Earth, but um, larger than was considered in those earlier situations. So that is sort of the introduction to what we are doing and why we think it might be worth doing. And this is sort of now moving on into the results that we found. And so just as a reminder, this is the boundary condition that we are imposing on the simulation. Um, actually, it's not quite the boundary condition. The boundary condition we impose is slightly smoother than this. So this is a slightly higher resolution version of the boundary condition, but we put a boundary condition very similar to this on our the numerical simulations. Um, and then this is a snapshot of the radial flow in near the top of the core that comes out of our simulation. And so we see in sort of orange and blue, all of this small scale structure, upwellings and downwellings, and turbulence um, going on in regions where heat flux out of the core is relatively high. Um, but under the Pacific and African large low velocity provinces where there's not much heat flux going out of the core because the mantle is hot. We see the suppression of the small scale convection. There's not no convection going on. There's not no radial motion, but there's certainly much weaker um, radial motion in those regions. Uh, this sort of solid black contour is sort of the bounds of where the large low velocity provinces um, come from the seismic tomography models. And so you can see that um, you know, the, this regions of suppressed convection are being very much controlled by the imposed um, seismic structure or mantle structure as revealed by seismology. And so that's the flow, lots of small scale flow in some regions, not much small scale flow in other regions. What does that do to the magnetic field? Well, we see a very similar thing. So this is now the radial magnetic field from that snapshot of our simulation. Um, and again, we see lots of small scale structure in the radial field being generated by the convection in regions where the convection is vigorous. And then in regions where we do not have this vigorous small scale convection, we don't see that structure. And we see a um, relatively weak radial magnetic field at the top of the core and longer wavelength structures in the magnetic field. So we see this clear distinction between what's going on under the large low velocity provinces and outside the large low velocity provinces. Now, of course, this is results from a simulation where we can go to um, much higher resolution 
then is um, obtainable by looking at the geomagnetic field um, due to sort of the upward continuation problem and screening of by the crossflow magnetic field or even comparing to the halo magnetic field where we have much less data. And so uh, we need to consider sort of what this looks like, not just in a snapshot, but in the time average or over some amount of time and not in such fine detail, but it's sort of a longer wavelength picture of this um, structure. And so this is an example um, of what happens to the uh, flow field as we go from a snapshot to averaging over the duration of our simulation, which is for this simulation, a few tens of thousands of model years. Uh, and so now you see in the time average, all of that small scale structure sort of averages out because you know these small scale roles are drifting around. And so where things are positive and things are negative, all of that small scale details tends to um, average out, but you're left with sort of a large scale pattern of upwelling under the large low velocity provinces, particularly under the Pacific and regions of downwelling sort of um, surrounding those so where the mantle is cooler. So that's what we're seeing in the radial flow. And then these arrows are the horizontal flow again, time averaged. Um, and you can see there's sort of a, a westward flow, flow here coming across uh, the Atlantic and then diverting um, towards more polar regions as we cross the Americas skirting around the Pacific and then coming back down in this particular simulation sort of over um, I guess, uh, Central Eurasia uh, and the Middle East and then rejoining sort of as it comes back down across Africa to a westward equatorial flow across the Pacific. And then there's sort of a return flow here in um, across the Atlantic, sorry. And then there's a return flow here in the Pacific. Uh, different simulations. So this is one of the simulations I'm going to focus on throughout this talk. We've done a, a, a few different simulations. They will the details of exactly what they show will vary, but I'll try and focus on sort of the large scale similarities between the different simulations. And so that general sort of structure of westward flow across the Atlantic, skirting up around the Pacific, and then coming back down uh, is is something that we see in the flows in in all of the simulations in the time average. Um, and this is sort of reminiscent of sort of the um, gyre, the eccentric gyre that was seen in Luis's um, uh, uh, core flow inversion, and as many other people have seen in core flow inversions, this sort of eccentric gyre, um, uh, as it's called, of flow is often seen in those sorts of in those sorts of uh, observational studies. Here's the time average magnetic field at the top of the core. Um, and so you can see that this particular field, uh, it's got a predominantly dipolar structure, but there are um, flux patches at high latitudes that are stronger than, than average, um, sort of here, sort of, um, I guess, sort of near the, the date line um, in both the Northern and sort of Southern Pacific. Um, and then depending on uh, how bright you are, your room you're sitting in, you might also see that there's these patches of reverse blocks here over South America um, and in the Indian Ocean. So there's a greenish patch here and a where we might otherwise expect pink and a pinkish patch here where we might otherwise expect green um, over India. And similarly here, uh, South America and the Caribbean, a greenish patch where we might expect pink and a pinkish patch where we might otherwise expect green. And again, the details of the high latitude patches and these equatorial reverse flux patches varies between simulations, but that's something that we see um, pretty consistently in all of our runs, as I'll show in a bit more detail later. And so those are the sorts of things that we see in our simulations. We obviously would like to compare those with what we know about the Earth's field. And what we know about the Earth's field, both in terms of the magnetic field and flow in the core, um, varies depending on what kind of time scale we look at. Obviously, modern day, we have excellent coverage from geomagnetic observatories and from satellite observations that let us know the structure of the Earth's magnetic field at the core mantle boundary in quite good detail, but it's only a very you know, small, uh, short snapshot in time. Um, and similarly for sort of snapshots of flow. But you can see that there are patches of high intensity at high latitudes. There are places where there are reverse flux patches. This eccentric gyre um, can be seen in this flow field. And so what we've done is we have compared 
our simulations to GUFM, sort of 400 year reconstruction. So this is um, what GUFM looks like over the Earth's field over the last 400 years. And again, it's got various structures. And we've compared our simulations to GUFM. And so we've got taken every 400 years in this simulation and used a number of different metrics of what the structure of the field looks like um, coming from Christensen et al. Um, and their measures of what makes excellent or good or marginal um, agreement with the field. And we can see that a lot of the time there is excellent or good agreement, but not all of the time. Um, and so this particular simulation often looks like the modern day Earth, but not all of the time. Um, but that's okay because, you know, Earth doesn't always look like the modern day Earth either. So we've also compared to GGF 100K. Um, uh, skip that. I don't know what, um, right? And so this is sort of what GGF 100K has done over the last 100,000 years. So this is another reconstruction of from now from paleomagnetic data. It's lower resolution, um, but we can see how these various um, measures have, have changed through time. Um, and GGF 100K, right, which is to say, you know, large long-term field does not always look like the last 400 years either. And so one of the problems with those locked dynamos is although they might look like G GUFM, they wouldn't look like GGF because they don't have enough variability, whereas our simulations do have a similar variability to GGF 100K, at least some of them do. Another really interesting question is what the secular variation does in these simulations. We have relatively quiet secular variation over the Pacific at the moment. Um, there are questions as to whether or not that persists through time. And so this is um, paleo-secular variation um, as derived from GGF 100K, Pinoska et al. And so this is yeah, sort of an observational constraint on lateral variations and secular variation. Some regions appear to have more secular variation. Some regions appear to have less. Um, the same is true in our simulations. I'm not saying that this is a particularly good match between these two. Some of our simulations look a little bit more like this than others, but I think there's a lot more work to be done, both in terms of what sort of variations, secular variation, do you see in the simulations? For our simulations, they tend to be less variation in secular variation, horizontal variation in secular variation, than um, suggested by GGF 100K. And so that brings me more or less through my whistle stop tour of what we have been doing and what we have found. So we've been really interested in whether or not there's a large scale um, influence of the thermal anomalies in the mantle on the CMB. Um, in the simulations, there's definitely suppression of convection under those thermal anomalies um, and hence the magnetic field. Um, these anomalies are very long lived, large scale. So we would expect a long lived, large scale non-zonal structure in the flow in the field from our simulations. There are some evidence that that is true um, from observations, but I think both from a simulations and observations and comparison of the two, which is a non-trivial task, much more work needs to be done. Um, and as I said, yeah, we sort of, if you want to see yet more details, um, we've got an article out in Nature Geoscience earlier this year, and that is probably a good place to stop. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, give John a big uh, round of applause. Thank you. Um, now we can open the floor for questions. If you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand or you can type it in the chat. So we have two questions. The first is from Kathy. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Anita. Hi, John. Thanks for that uh, nice, nice presentation. Um, I had a question about um, the features that you see uh, running or don't see, maybe, I'm not sure, running across the Indian Ocean. In If we look in GUFM, you see these uh, concentrated uh, flux patches that move westward across the Indian Ocean into the Atlantic and all that. And they're very, there's very prominent sort of drift in that feature. And I'm wondering whether you actually see drift in your dynamo or whether those features just sort of appear and then go away. Uh, it will depend a bit on the simulation. I've not looked in great detail at all of the simulations of what the features do 
through time. Um, so in this particular simulation, there would be, there probably wouldn't be that much drift across the Indian Ocean. There would be drift sort of, because the average flow is right. um, sort of westward across Indonesia. But in this particular simulation, it's also sort of eastward coming into the Indian Ocean from the other side. So actually in the Indian Ocean itself, the features on average would sort of appear and disappear and not drift in any particular direction for this particular simulation. Do I have the time average flows from the other simulations? In... Yeah, so this simulation, uh, make sure I'm looking at the right one. Um, Yeah, so in this simulation, the time average flow across the Indian Ocean is, is westward. So this is a different simulation than the one I was showing. Um, and so for this simulation, we would, on average, see westward drift across the Indian Ocean of those features. But it's certainly not true in all of the simulations that all features would just drift across the Indian Ocean. Right. And there's no uh, mechanism for really identifying the systematic differences across those... Uh, I get, there would be. We could do, uh, I guess, things similar to what Nicole's done, looking mm -hmm. at sort of yeah. tracking patches through time to make a time longitude plot. We've not done that, but that would be something that might show if there was a systematic. Yeah, so uh, I think Nicole's been looking at one of your simulations just now, and I'm not sure whether she's come to any particular conclusion yeah. about it. And I think it will depend a bit on which simulation it is, because the you know the details of the flow does vary, particularly for right. there. Like there's some features of the flow which are quite um, consistent across our simulation. So like the westward drift across the Atlantic seems very consistent, mm -hmm. um, but not so much on the Indian side. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Kathy. Weather. <laughs> you can unmute yourself. Maybe I'm not pronouncing your name right, but uh, you can admit yourself anyway. <laughs> Maybe some connection problem. In the meantime, if anybody else has a question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we don't hear you. you. You can type the question or... Because oh. I see you are unmuted, but... Oh. Uh, in the meantime, if that's okay, I will take... Uh, Hideo, she son. The question, yeah, and I yeah. will read uh, your caddy. Sorry. Okay, thank you. You can ask your question. Me? Yes, please. Yes. Ah, uh, uh, I think it, the the ECMA number is much uh, larger or small, slower and smaller. Uh, anyway, it's very different from the actual Earth. And what do you estimate the? Uh, influence of the very different ECMAN number to the this simulation. Yeah, so yeah, we got to ECMAN 10 to the minus 5, the Earth is ECMAN 10 to the minus 12, ECMAN 10 to the minus 15, um, but we are at least low enough in ECMAN number that sort of we're in the right dynamic regime that um, Viscosity is not playing a strong role, um, Coriolis um, is dominating. And so some of the work that Julian O'Bear has been doing has shown that um, for his simulations where he's been able to go on and on and on, he's got down to something like Ecman 10 to the minus 11. He's not seen any dramatic changes in the sort of fundamental dynamics um, mm -hmm. as he's moved down to the lower Ekman number. And so we're probably at a low enough Ekman number to be in the right dynamic regime. Um, and so... The, I think a key thing that we compared to the previous simulations is that the scale of convection 
in our Dynamo simulations is much smaller than the scale of the pattern imposed by the CMB. And in those previous simulations, that wasn't the case. And that's why they kept getting the locking, right? They had very large scale roles in their core because they were at a higher Ekman number and at a lower Rayleigh number. Um, and so I think that the key difference is that as long as we've got down to a place where we are sort of uh, strongly rotationally constrained and sufficiently small scale convection, then stronger rotational constraint and smaller small scale convection, making the small scale convection smaller probably won't change the, the picture because we've already got that separation of scales, but in, until we go further, we won't, we won't really know. Um, so yeah, one of the things we would, um, would like to do is is go um, go to lower Ekman as well to make sure that um, these sorts of sorts of uh, effects still happen. Um, I think one of the other things is sort of the the Prandtl number is an interesting question as well. Um, uh, again, you know, Julian has, has sort of been able to get to much you know, essentially Earth like conditions for those combinations of parameters. Um, and not seeing great changes in the dynamics. So in some sense, we're hopeful that our not very Earth-like simulations are still Earth-like enough. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, Kathy could type the question in the chat. I'm gonna write it. Uh, so, when you say suppressed convection beneath the LLSPPs, mm -hmm. you mean thermally stably stratified layer beneath? Yeah, so in these simulations... Do you have an estimate of its thickness? And just a comment, the lateral transition between convection and not seems incredibly sharp. Okay, that's it. Right. Yeah, so in these simulations, there is thermal stable stratification um, in these regions, uh, I forget how thick the, the length thickness varies depending on the choice of parameters, particularly on how strong the lateral heterogeneity is. Um, the Pacific lens tends to be thicker than the African lens. Um, and I forget what the thicknesses are. Uh, the, I, 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 I thickest a couple hundred kilometers, um, but I don't remember the exact numbers. Um, and I've forgotten what the final part of that question was. Sorry, yeah. It was just a comment uh, saying the lateral transition between convention and not seems incredibly sharp. Uh, yeah, certainly on the small scale. Yeah, it's um, you're essentially. Um, either um, uh, sub-adiabatic heat flow and convection is suppressed, and then pretty rapidly, once you are super adiabatic, you you convect quite vigorously. Um, and so the fluid um, sort of uh, you know tends to drift out from under um, these. Um, uh, the, these uh, LLBPs, and then once it starts cooling, it pretty rapidly starts to um, con convect. Um, yeah, so there, at least in the in these sorts of snapshots, it is. It's not so obvious in the in the time average, but in the snapshots, there is quite a quite a stark boundary. Okay, many thanks, Kathy. Say thanks. So is there any other question from the audience? And I guess just if I can, oh. one other thing I'm thinking about that, that, that question is another thing that we do not have in this simulation, in these simulations is compositional driving to the convection. Um, and so that's something that we're working on at the moment is looking at the influence of having both compositional and thermal convection, um, which might change everything. And so in terms of both sort of that question and the how Earth-like is our model, I actually think that the lack of compositional convection in these simulations is, um, so I think it's the more interesting question to, to look at and that's what we're looking at now. Um, it sounds very interesting. Thank you very much.
thanks for giving uh, the very interesting uh, talk. I'm gonna just, if that's okay. Oh yes, another big round of applause, of course. <laughs> um, so if that's okay now, I'm gonna uh, share a slide, a closing slide. So we're really happy to have you uh, today. Thank you very much. Um, for the next uh, seminar, we're gonna have Ben White from MIT. We also have uh, dates up until November that are filled to just to be confirmed. Keep an eye on your mailing list. Um, if you missed previous uh, seminars, if you wanna watch and rewatch this one, you can find it on our YouTube channel and um, please uh, uh, feel free to share uh, this information with your colleagues. So thank you very much again to attend and uh, we hope to see you soon.